So I want to introduce uh, my new friend, uh, Carl Jonas. Hi. Hi. <laughs> thank you welcome. for having me. Uh, yeah, welcome to the channel. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure to have you. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I'm a singer-songwriter. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my journey as a songwriter, uh, not, not journey as a singer, but a journey, my journey as a songwriter started within hours of an awakening. Mm. And that's why I am here. I was yeah. Here. What led up to that awakening or what, what kind of, was it just out of the blue or were you on some spiritual path or how'd that go? I was definitely on a spiritual path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, definitely. Were you were you interested in like a particular like Buddhism or some? Were you involved in like a traditional Dharma setting or? Uh, I was involved in. I had been very deeply involved in something called Tantric Kriya Yoga. Uh -huh. It's a very old, uh, very traditional Tantric Yoga. Yeah. Uh, um, and it's it's not anything re resembling what what goes under the name Tantra today. Right. That, had basically nothing to do with sex or, or meeting someone else, but it was only inner stuff, very extensive meditation. I, the, the great Kriya Yoga is something like five hours mm. in the dark room. Uh, so I was really like get, giving it all. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very determined. <laughs> yeah. What was your What was your motivation to get involved with with that Kriya Yoga? It was uh, reading. Uh, the order, the order of the of a yogi, by mm -hmm. Paramahansa Yogananda. That was yeah. definitely the, the thing that really, I just knew that this was the only thing I knew I really wanted. Mm, beautiful. How old were you when you read that? I'm not sure. I think I had already started with yoga. Mm -hmm. So around 25, 26, 27, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and how long did it take before you um, before you had this shift or this, this this awakening? It. I started in in I would say January of ninety eight, mm -hmm. and it would then the shift would take place in January of two thousand seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it and was about nine years. Nine years, yeah, a lot of practice, a lot of meditation and contemplation. A lot of practice, uh, a lot of meditation. And the biggest part, I would say, was giving up that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, I mean, when I, when I started the Kriya Yoga, I thought that I would do this for the rest of my life because it was so incredible. Mm -hmm. But it did to my, you know, to my life experience. Yeah. But then after maybe five, five six years, <clears throat> I just recognized that it gave me absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just completely empty. Mm -hmm. So I, I let, you know, more or less let go of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then I became more interested into uh, Byron Katie's work and Eckhart Tolle. Mm -hmm. But I had the kind of same perception with, with, with them as with the Kriya Yoga. It's like, it was great stuff, but it was not really, it was not really what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And at that point, in 2006, I got in. Um, I got into non-duality, mm -hmm. and that was really. It was very different because, at least the, the non-duality that I was exposed to then, which was very pr prominent back then, was this uh, excess. Uh, this, um, you know, there's nothing to do. There's Tony there's Parsons. Yeah, very a bit Tony Parsons, but but not really. But other people, but but kind yeah. of that that style or that approach. Yeah, yeah. That approach, yeah. And yeah. I think I was really I was a perfect uh, candidate for that approach because I had tried so hard. Yeah. I didn't. Just, it was not just a fancy idea. I had really, really tried. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I I, uh, I watched. Um, <laughs> You know, I just binge watched YouTube videos for about a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And then I felt, okay, now I'm done with watching videos. I want to see someone in the physical. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I Googled uh, non duality retreat Sweden because I'm from Sweden. Mm -hmm. And I got one hit 
with a New Year's retreat with a man named Nukunu. Mm. And uh, I had never heard of him. I was pretty skeptical. Uh -huh. But it was like, if this is the only thing that is available for me, I, I just have to go. Yeah. Uh, so I decided, you know, maybe a day before it started to actually go there. And um, in, in the, it was a 10 day retreat. It was announced as a silent retreat. But after one day, Nukuno decided to make it into a sharing retreat. Mm. Because he said, there's so many people in here that have done so much meditation and you go into this silent, silent space and you're very peaceful, but nothing is really confronted. Mm. Uh, so in, in the, quite many was, you know, there's not many people that was happy with that because they were really looking forward to sitting in 10 days of silence. Uh, but I really, I, I, I think I got a really good feeling for, for Lukunda from the start. So I was like, yeah, let's go. It sounds like he has really good insight. I, I appreciate that he had that insight and the, the, the attunement to what the group was needing actually and willingness to be flexible. That's, that's, that's powerful. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that with him a lot, mm -hmm. that he's yeah. really open to other people saying something, and then he can change something. It's very, very flexible. Yeah. Um, Did he have a sort of satsang approach? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, he has something called, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, oh, yeah, non-dual therapy. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, yeah, taking in the, the, the emotional stuff and... Uh, yeah. It's, Sounds like a good teacher. Does he still teach? Yeah, yeah he does. Cool. Yeah. yeah. That's great. And, and on the in the middle of the retreat, uh, we were on this. Um, the last thing we did that that day or evening was a, an exercise, uh, an inquiry that is called that is called associated associated inquiry. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? No. No. It's uh, maybe it's, it's named otherwise, other places, but that's what calls it. It's basically you sit uh, two and two, and you, if you and I would do this, it would start with me asking you the question, how is it to experience I am, with the emphasis on experience right now. Mm -hmm. Then you would have, you would take five minutes to, to put words on this mm -hmm. again and again and again. And you could you could use the same word. You could just use silence for five minutes. It's not about being creative or coming up with something. It's you expressing that truth and being received by someone else. So there's no higher or lower because then we're going to shift. So you're going to do the same to me and I'm going to reply to that. And I can use your words. If mm -hmm. those were true to me, I could just sit there and say, I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. know. It's like no, no frames really. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a great, I think that's a really cool practice. I've not done anything specifically like that, but what a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's incredible. It's so powerful. Um, and the, the, the only really, what do you say? The only really uh, frame is that you always keep to the question, how is it to experience I am? Not mm -hmm. because people tend to go like, how is it to be me? And you know, yeah. so you have to really like it's the I am and experience. How is yeah. it? Yeah, very cool. Yeah, and then then we were sitting on two two lanes, so we changed partner again and again. And the last partner that I got was with a woman uh, that I had this romantic attraction to, and we had you know we hadn't really gone into that at all because we were at this retreat, but suddenly. We couldn't hide it. It was so obvious. And mm -hmm. Nukuna saw that. So, so he was like pointing at us and saying, oh, look, I can see the hormones flying. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yes. Everything was really celebrated. It was nothing yeah. like, oh, take it easy, guys. You know, look, right. hopefully just celebrating whatever was yeah. happening. That's great. Yeah, it was really fantastic. And when she asks me this question, how is it to experience I am? I first pretty much tell her what I have told my previous partners, that it's really silent, it's really still. But then out of our this playfulness between us, something completely new emerged out of me. Mm -hmm. And I told her, like, but it's strange, you know, because no matter how silent or still it gets, 
It's as if there's something here behind the back of my head that I never get to see. And the moment I touched here with my hand, there was a, like a very subtle energetic recognition that if I were to say, I didn't think that there was no words involved, but if I, to communicate, the feeling was like, it's actually nothing there. <laughs> I've, been, I've been all this time I've been looking for something which isn't there and now yeah. it's like I feel it's just hair and skull it's, it's mm. like and that brought about a very compact silence mm -hmm. I said what's what's happening now and <laughs> just as that happened Nukuru says you know, gives the instruction to like this okay we are going to end the exercise, so thank your partner and sit up and close your eyes. And then he says the following, just let go. Mm. No one has ever got it. Buddha never got it. Jesus never got it. I never got it. You will never get it. Just let go. Mm. And when I heard the words, Buddha never got it, it just, my whole seeking just turned into complete just a complete checkmate. It was like, if mm -hmm. Buddha didn't get it, what, mm -hmm. what is the Swedish dude doing here? What, what mm -hmm. have I been trying to achieve for 10 years? <laughs> it, 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 it was such a complete checkmate. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, and from that place of checkmate, I just fell out of my meditation post because that's also the, the, an instruction that it gives. Like just because you have a mattress behind, your, your, uh, behind you so you can fall back. Mm. And so when I fell back out of my meditation box, there was this contraction in my heart area that just <clears throat> exploded. And the moment it exploded, I instantly knew that it had been there all the time. Mm -hmm. I also knew that there could have been no awareness of the contraction as long as it was in place. Mm -hmm. And the next thing that happens is a I sit up and I notice that I feel so incredibly relaxed. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, I didn't even know that it was possible, this level mm -hmm. of relaxation. And I start to look around and I notice that it's something that has shifted in mm -hmm. my perception. And I'm trying to figure out what is it, what has changed. And slowly it dawns, but it's not something new. Yeah. It's something that's been here all the time. It's just haven't what you know, what I, I haven't perceived it. Mm -hmm. And at that point, and it just it, it, the perception is everybody just fits in. Mm -hmm. That's the perception. Yeah. And my mind my, this is when my mind starts to become active. It's like, is this awakening? Is this enlightening? Is this nobody here? All these concepts that I have been fed starts to come up and wants to be uh what do you say validated confirmed yeah validated confirmed. Confirmed. Yeah. yeah and it was completely empty so not, none of none of the concepts were mm -hmm. uh, and i felt kind of shy around my heart because it was just so wide open mm -hmm. and at this stage the, the the evening was over so i went out and she we were just planning to take a, uh, an evening walk before I went to bed, which I usually did every, every evening. But this walk, I maybe got 20, 30 steps. And then I was absolutely mesmerized by the sound of a creek that was running by. And mm. I mean, you, you heard this every time you went out to the meditation hall because it was so close. But now, I was like, wow, this is mm. how, how running water really sounds. Yeah. How could I? How could I have missed this? It's so obvious. It's. It's. And, and then my mind started to become really. What is this? Is this awakening? Is this? <laughs> nothing was. Nothing worked. No concepts worked. Yeah. Then, this voice out of nowhere appeared, and with an incredible authority, just declared that, like the authority of total love, just said. It's the peace that passes all understanding. Mm. 
And that, vo that sentence just completely silenced this mind's attempt to try to figure out or determine what had happened. Mm -hmm. And as soon as that stopped, um, there was no question anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I was that answer that the mind was trying to get in a defined form, and suddenly when that was not present, there was no, no question. And then I started to laugh. Because <laughs> it was such a joke. It's like, wow, I've been looking for something that was here, and this, that can only be here <laughs> all the time. And it doesn't matter what, what words he used for it, what labels, it's completely irrelevant. Uh, and I just could not stop laughing. <laughs> I was laughing for 40 minutes outside in the cold. Mm. And then I went inside, I said, I, I need to try to get some sleep. And I couldn't sleep because it, this joy just was there. And that mm -hmm. was during that night, that was when the music started. Like it was just beating through this urge to express what had been revealed. Had you, had you been um, musically inclined previously? Yes, or? I already was a musician. I yeah. was a singer, I was, I was trained, I was, uh, attending a school for pro professional singers. Mm -hmm. So I was studying folk music at the time. Yeah. But I was, I was very displeased with that because the, the, the lyrics in folk music is, is a lot about, you know, I'm the victim and you're the bad guy, you know. Yeah, sure. And that yeah. Didn't, didn't resonate with my yoga and meditation practice. So, and I, but yeah, this was the experience that allowed me to, to really become so to speak a songwriter, a songwriter so something more more authentic was just obviously coming through the Absolutely. channel of you already yeah. being a sort of singer that's cool yeah, yeah. like a bird from the the seeds of time out of my hand your song moved in me like a tide swept away the notion of identity like footprints in the sand you made me dissolve into the unknown Yeah. 
was when I when I got back to school, my my classmates were like, "What, what is this? <laughs> what, where did this come from? It's like, what, never heard um, anything like it." <laughs> from, that's from beautiful. Me. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, wonderful. Wow, how cool! Now, um, just out of curiosity, the the person you were sitting face to face with, did she? also perceive something like this uh, shift in you happening or did she corroborate something that she at, went through as well or was that just happen just happened to be the case uh, I not not what I know of yeah um, not, not what I know of uh, but yeah. there was there was another guy who had an awakening mm. on the same street and I'm he said we met a couple of years ago for the first time for many years and when he realized that I was that guy, yeah. He said, he said to me like, "You are the most important person in my life." Oh. And he was standing. He was standing behind his beside behind his or beside his wife. <laughs> mm. Wow, wow, it's yeah. it's really fascinating how these energetic shifts yeah. can happen in clusters or like you can bump into the right person at the right time, and and it's it's really like a powerful catalyst and. Yeah. Uh, so I, I know what he's talking about there. That's really neat. Yeah. And yeah. it's so funny to hear him talk about it because he said, yeah. I was so jealous at you <laughs> because he had, <laughs> he had been with Lacuna for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. And this was the first time I met him and he didn't know that I had done anything. Yeah. He was like, he comes this young dude and he just gets it. And, yeah. and, and the last, last day on, on the, the last morning, on this retreat, he was lying in his bed and, and having this conversation with himself that I am absolutely hopeless. This young guy just comes and gets it like that. I've been doing so much and it's just mm -hmm. hopeless. And out of that, he started to question who is it that is hopeless. Mm -hmm. And that just flipped. Yeah. You know, that, that, that sort of highlights a, a, a wider thing I see sometimes that where I do see that because especially because I do these videos and people will say, I'm so, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, what's going on? And, but even that frustration as a reaction to, to the, to the awakeness, maybe of another or whatever, even if it feels frustrating, it feels, makes you feel hopeless or whatever, that may be exactly what you need. You may need to come to an end of your seeking, even through desperation, because I'll tell you what woke me up was desperation. Like it was absolute abject, failure at making any making myself happy in any way and so it's not comfortable but just exposing yourself to people sometimes who who have gone through this it's it's powerful and that's like a lot of what i do on this channel and why i'm interviewing you and so forth is it does have an effect somehow you know it's mysterious in, in a lot of ways but it definitely does yeah yeah definitely yeah yeah cool how are things after after that retreat oh it was uh like a roller coaster for mm -hmm. about one year or two years. Yeah. A huge yeah. roller coaster. And I was very much uh, dependent on Nukuno. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, but, and he was a great support. He was oh, good. But, but the thing was, I, I had no, I had nothing, you know, there was nothing in me that called me to be in a satsang with him mm -hmm. or in a retreat, but I just wanted to know, you know, food, do normal stuff. That, yeah. that was what, what, what I needed. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It was all, and he was, he, I think it was really great how he uh, supported the awakening that, that, that occurred because he, he told me like, now you should not listen to me. You mm -hmm. have to listen to yourself. Like if mm -hmm. you need to go out, if you can't sit in satsang, just go out in nature. And it, that was so powerful because I think we're so heavily conditioned to have this authority figure. Wow. And to break that is, is uh, very much part of, of cultivating and awakening or whatever. Absolutely. He, he sounds like a very insightful teacher. Um, yes. I wonder, does he do interviews? Oh, yes. He would, I, can def, I would love to connect. Does he, speak, he speaks English? Absolutely. He's Danish. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah that'd, be, that'd be a fun interview for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah he, he, he's, he's been doing it for a long time. You know, he was in Osho Risk and uh, he has a lot of stories to tell. <laughs> yeah. That would be cool. Yeah. Right on. 
Well, so so let's talk about music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I listened to a handful of your tracks, and I thought, it's, well, it's beautiful. The voice is beautiful, the guitar, and but the the lyrics, you know, um, poignant, poetic, and transmitting uh, of of the sort of non dual message or this truth that we're that we're talking about or talking around because we can't actually talk directly about it, but. Yeah. Um, so, so ha t tell me how that sort of laced itself throughout your life and, and how this has played out for you. Yeah. As I said about my uh, folk music education, I was very un unhappy with the lyrics because mm -hmm. they did not resonate with what I wanted to express. Um, and then I, you know, I had an inspiration for maybe one or two years where I had just I was just allowing things to flow. Mm -hmm. But at some point, I recognized that there is something with my lyrics that doesn't work. And it would take me into a teacher we call, um, oh, what's his name? Pat Patterson, mm -hmm. where I recognized that there was a lot of skill that I did not have when it came to communicate with lyrics, like how do you capture a listener so that the song becomes his or hers? Yeah. And that's what, when, when, when you get into that kind of lyric writing, the lyrics become really potent. Mm -hmm. because, and it's like small things. It's like one of my lyrics starts, the wind is playing in my hair, waves are crashing, my feet are bare. Like when you reference the wind is playing in my hair, Everybody knows how that feels, so you're mm -hmm. not, not going to try and go and see. I wonder how that was for that guy, because you just immediately go. You know what it feels like. Mm -hmm. You also know what it feels like to stand bare feet. So yeah. In that sense, the, the, the lyric immediately becomes the listener's lyrics, because mm -hmm. you go to your own memory bank of what mm -hmm. that feels like. Yeah. And that's that I had no clue about that when I started my so my my early my early songs. It took me 10 years to write mm. these songs that I'm writing now. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot more than that. Uh, mm -hmm. Because what I didn't see was that there was stuff in that I needed to see and unpack that I didn't want to unpack. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, in a very subtle way, non-duality became a scapegoat yeah. for dealing with yeah and uh i say that with, with total compassion because it, it was not a clever choice it's just right. that's that's what unconsciousness looks like that you're you're right on the money there and um i love that you uh, had art to keep you honest in this way it, it's yeah. it's one thing to realize the absolute and to fully blow up and dissolve into the absolute and, and awake in that way it's wonderful and then at the same time, you still have to go back into the relative world and live. And how do you live? You know, you can you can almost use that absolute as an escape um, physically, energetically, and even just meditate all day long and, and speak that way and so forth. Or yeah, you can, exactly. or you can find, you can go back and find those areas of suffering that made you want to wake up in the first place. And then, and then find the you, you sort of to, to, to just put it in Buddhist terms, find the emptiness in the form, the emptiness yeah. in the form, and and that that's when you become relatable. That's yeah. when you can write a song lyric that can immediately relate. Someone can immediately relate to and feel, and then the transmission comes through that yeah. instead of just trying to hit them in the face with a bunch of non dual dual terminology. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That was that was the journey I had to go through. Yeah. And it's an emotional journey as well. That's the, the thing I like to talk about with art is that I think a lot of people don't realize, even beginning artists don't realize how much of an emotional journey art, art is, um, being, being a creator. And, and that blows people out when they, re, they don't realize, yeah, you're supposed to feel frustration when you start working with art. You're supposed to feel doubt. That Those emotions are coming not because you're doing anything wrong, but because you're doing something right. You're being vulnerable. You're being open. You're opening your heart and self to the world and to... The suffering of humanity in a lot of ways and that's where that's where you have that channel to get to go so deeply inside and into the art and bring it forth you know i mean you know all this but it's a it's a wonderful journey yeah and also one aspect with with being an artist is that 
it becomes like if if if, if something un, unconscious is being processed, art is like on the forefront of that processing. Mm -hmm. So I've written songs, I've written song lines where I started to cry, but didn't know what, what it was about. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote another song one half year later, and I was like, oh, that was what that line was about. Mm -hmm. It made me cry, but it would take me to the, yeah. And yeah. That's, that's, that's why it's, it's also really an, an, a journey of exploration for very much the artist. Yeah, yeah. I, I can relate to this so much, um, not even just in art, but in even in life experiences or situations where you know something's there, you can feel it energetically, it opens you up, you may feel some intense emotions or release, but the, the real integration can take some time because it's just such a powerful movement or shift in the relative even. And then all of a sudden it's like, it just starts to dawn, oh, wow, that's why that happened or that's, that's how that happened. I can reach di people in different ways that I would have never been able to construct in my mind but life figured it out, you know, in this way, yeah. it put me through what I needed to go through. Yeah. 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 That's great. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and there was also something that, that occurred by, because I mean, this happened in 2007 and then I started to write these songs in 2017. The first song came and then the second song came 2018 in the summer. And that's when all of the other start, songs started to come. And at some point I had enough songs that I felt, okay, now, now the time is, is right to, to record an album. And it, it just was like so perfectly aligned that just when I started that process of recording my album, I happened to recognize the core of my relationship to my father, which is that he is a narcissist. Mm. And that would take 13 years from the awakening to unpack that fully. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew when I was 13, I remember the phone call I had with him and I just staring at the phone knowing that there's something wrong with, with there's something different with the way my father operates. But yeah. It would take me from the awakening at 33, it would take me till 45 uh, or 46 yeah. until I really recognized it. And, and when in the moment of recognition, something very similar to the awakening happened mm -hmm. immediately when I saw when there was no more um, denial, mm -hmm. because that, I mean, you know, if your father is narcissist, you know that something's off, but to, mm -hmm. to really go there and admit it, it's like, there's a lot of things that happens. You realize, that you never really had a father mm. that was really interested in your best because yeah. that that's life threatening to him yeah. from where yep. he was. And you realize that he was 100% uh, unconscious. Mm -hmm. so it, was not, it was not, you know, evil. <laughs> there was no evil at yeah. play. Yeah. Uh, and you also know that you've gone through something that is like an, an invisible struggle. Yeah. Like if someone hits you, you can see in the mirror that something is wrong here. Yeah. But but if you're in that kind of, of emotional abuse, the whole abuse is done such a way that yeah. it looks like really, you know, he can put he could put on the display of being the perfect father. Yes. So from everybody else, it looks like oh, you have a great father, and you know, everybody has their, their issues, but this is something else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, boy, I I want to reflect a few things on that. One is. I, I think that it, it would be easy for somebody to imagine, well, when you wake up or when you have the, these deep, profound, direct insights, the things like family issues, challenge, emotional challenges, relationship issues, that should be something that kind of dissolves early, but it's really not. That kind of comes way later. The, the closer emotional uh, baggage and, and, and fixations and stuff, those actually do take quite a while to really get underneath. It, it can take a long, long time. That's one thing. The other I wanted to say is um, that you're, you're, you're so right on the money where there's a lot of um, abuse verbal abuse, emotional abuse, or emotional neglect and so forth. But a lot of that happens in a very hidden way. Um, and it can happen through gaze aversion, the way that someone looks at you. It can happen through nonverbal communication. 
maybe even more powerfully than verbal communication, you know, um, yeah, neglectful behaviors, you know, emotional, complete de you know, detachment and things like that. And you don't have the conscious um, wherewithal to even recognize it as such. So it gets really deeply ingrained in you. And the third thing I wanted to say is um, I heard a psychologist say it this way, and I find it to be really accurate. And that is when you're ch especially a young child and you have a parent that can't take, can't do what they need to do as a parent in one way or another, either they can't provide the love, the support or the safety or security. They just don't have it together for whatever reason. It can be mental illness. It can be addictions or it can just be, they're just not mature enough. But the thing that happens is the child, the, 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 to recognize that I don't, I, the person that's supposed to be able to take care of me literally is not up for the job is so terrifying for a child that they'll immediately not look at that and they'll blame themselves. It'll feel like something's wrong with me. And that's a re and it happens so unconsciously yeah. that you'll carry that for years and not even realize what, what the dynamic is and why you self-sabotage and, and all those sorts of things. Yeah. 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 Totally, totally right. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing, what I also want to say is like, when I saw this, it was as if I could love my father for the first time, mm -hmm. because now I saw him for the first time, who he really is in his embodied yeah. version, without yeah. my, my wish of mm -hmm. who, I, who I wanted him to be. Yeah. And in that love, it was also so clear that there's no way I can engage my energy to have a connection with this guy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what, what, you know, if he's my father or anybody, yeah. it's like, yeah, because it's, it's just crazy. It, it's, yeah. it's like if, if someone, if, if he would slap me in my face every time, no one would question, like, of course you cannot have contact with him. Yeah, right. But since this is so subtle, mm -hmm. many people go like, well, have you tried you know, <laughs> yes. you know, non-violent communication and stuff like that? And it's really, yeah. <laughs> playing in my hair waves are crashing my feet are bare a revelation dawning in salty ocean air and this is more than just goodbye it's the ending of a life a web of eels and wounds where I was your supply This is how I draw the line This is holy ground For my heart to play and shine I will no longer be bound To anyone who's not aligned With this joy that I've found From now on Only love, only love Doesn't matter what you try to tell I know your every word now all too well and They can't reach me now Cause I'm no longer under your spell This is not to judge your blame Loving truth is all I claim Turning shadows to light was the essence of our game This is how I draw the line This is holy ground For my heart to play and shine I will no longer be bound To anyone who's not aligned With this 
this joy that I've found from now on. Only love, only love, only love. Cherished And, and it really goes, it, it kind of just, when I know what that, that, that is and, and people who grew up in, in reasonably healthy emotional environments and they go, well, everyone's a little dysfunctional. It's like, well, there's a little dysfunctional and there's a lot dysfunctional. And they, it, they look from a landscape of someone who has been brought up in, a, in an emotionally protected situation and they feel connected and so forth. And th it's very hard to look through that lens and see how actually disconnected a parent can be from a child and how manipulative and, and that stuff can be. And I know exactly what you mean by that. And, um, you know, of course your instincts are right. Um, yeah, and I want to really emphasize what you said about the love part. And it's true to really love someone, you have to see them for who they are, every aspect. And, and then you also see in one sense, they're innocent in that they probably never chose of a menu of options of how to live their life to be a narcissist. It, is a complex pattern of behaviors and abuse they went through probably and all that it's generational and who knows. Um, so they, they don't do it on purpose. It's not like they're out there trying to do that, but they literally don't see past the way their own ego constructs reality. And so, you know, this is why this leads to a bigger topic, but this is why for me and why I emphasize awakening, why it's such an important thing for someone who's interested in doing it. If someone's really interested in digging in and you want to make a change in yourself, your life, your family and the world, that's the best way you're going to do it. You can't control how that's going to play out, but it, without seeing past the ego boundaries, it's so easy to stay in the same conditioning patterns you grew up in or a slight version, different little bit different version of them, but really unchanged. Um, but to, to finally be able to go beyond those ego boundaries, that's when you can really start seeing clearly what's going on inside you, what's going on inside everyone around you. And then you, you really have the access to unconditional love at some point when you just see... It's just about clear seeing. It's about yeah. clear seeing. That's that's what that's what's needed if you want, you know, peace. Yeah. Yeah. And it, another thing that also was immediate, an immediate uh, outcome of the seeing was that I realized that it had never anything to do with me. Mm -hmm. it, it it was, you know, mm -hmm. that's that was extremely uh, settling mm -hmm. to to have that. There was never anything wrong with me because mm -hmm. it was yeah. you know you would place anybody in here that was you know strong enough to not just buy into it blindly and he would have been he or she would have been treated the same way mm. yeah yeah what a nice um valuable and uh transformative thing to finally recognize I am not at fault for my parents, <laughs> their, 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 their own challenges, their whatever, even, even severe abuse. It's like, none of that was really anything I deserved, nor was it ever really about me. And I actually can function, be okay and feel peace knowing I didn't have parents that could take care of me or one yeah. parent, you know, whatever it is. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a good thing to be able to see at some point. Um, because that's forgiveness for, for the whole, for all of it, for yourself, for your parents, for. And another, th there was so many insights that happened, like explosion of insight. One, another insight that I got was that I know with 100% certainty that I had chosen this. Mm. I don't know, I, I don't know how, but it was just a knowing that 
Mm -hmm. On some level, I have chosen to go through this, and this was one mm -hmm. of the most important aspects of this human experience to, to mm -hmm. go through, through this uh, narcissistic conditioning. Yeah. I felt like that at some point as well, where it was like, I don't even know if I can say I chose it, but it made, it made perfect sense to go through exactly the kind of suffering I had to go through. I would not wish that, that on any, I wouldn't wish anyone, wish on anyone what I went through until I was 24, like in my mind, it was just so bad, but it's, but I'm, but I'm grateful for it above all, all other experiences of my life up until that point, because that's what woke me up. Um, and it worked out so it does when you're going through this it does not feel like it's perfectly orchestrated it feels horrible <laughs> it feels like confusing and disorienting and you're lost and you know the seeker right but at some point it could become so clear or it did for me that like this was so perfectly orchestrated i wouldn't change any of it because it was so it was perfectly set up you know it's, yeah, it's because, fascinating yeah because eventually i mean that was what brought about the, the yeah. Dissolvement of that unconscious mm -hmm. dysfunctional codependency patterns. Yeah. Because yeah. It, it became so painful that mm -hmm. in the end, you just had to, to look at it. Yeah. 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 And, and interestingly, I think uh, my experience is when you see through these personality disorders, you know, narcissistic personality disorders, all the different ones, there's yeah, dependent personality. That, that the way I use the term narcissist, I don't know if, if anybody else would. Be, you know, I'm not in, in the position that I can clinically say sure, what a person sure. but, yeah. but it's not the point. It's just that you recognize that something is really not working well there. And, and yeah. the, the yeah. term narcissist just cut it for me. And, and all of that goes for that. You, I mean, my guess would be your instinct is pretty close. But, but I will say that by seeing those patterns, um, and for me, a lot of it was, well, a lot of it's just interacting with different people, some family stuff and, and med school and all of it. But seeing those patterns um, in people, what's fascinating is you can see how the roots of them are in all of us. Like they're, all of us are selfish to some degree, of course. And, but but does that get so pronounced in our experience that we literally cannot even see past our own wants and, and drives to, to the person that we're like supposed to be taking care of or we're in con we're in you know emotional connection with? Um, so so. Yeah, when we see it out there, then we can also see, oh, I can also see how I have those those roots. I can see those tendencies. They're human tendencies. And you can also see with under enough stress and with the conditioning being set up a certain way, that gets so pronounced that it is very much a disorder. And you will, you know, sabotage relationships and stuff. But it, again, it's just, it, it, for me, it makes, um, ma makes available this knowing and this sort of... Um, it's almost like a, like a brotherhood and sisterhood of of the the human sufferer that we all have the potential to suffer and we all have suffered at some point and we all know how that works um and we just get lost in it and and there's no guilty party really in that it's a sort of collective delusion um and and it's just transformative to see that and feel that um and then you're for me then i'm open to suffering i'm op i'm okay with other people suffering around me and especially when they're willing to open to it, the, to this insight themselves and wake up and stuff, um, there's nowhere I'm afraid to go anymore at all. I, I, can, I can go to the depths of despair, to suffering, helplessness, hopelessness, anger, rage. Like I've been to all these places with people and I will continue to go there if that's where they need to go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. There's one thing, distinction that I would make in, because uh, I think it's, potentially a bit harmful or dangerous if we say that everybody has these uh, narcissistic tendencies because mm -hmm. my distinction of it is that what I would call a narcissist is someone who is not capable of functioning in a relationship where there is truly equal equili equilibrium and a give and take that is just, oh, you give me, oh, then I want to give you. It, it's just, that's yeah. a natural movement. Mm -hmm. And with what I define as a narcissist is someone who, who cannot function that way because the mm -hmm. only way he knows, he or she knows how to feel, have some kind of positive feeling, is if I am as a narcissist, if I am a bit better than you, mm -hmm. if I have control, then yeah. I can somewhat peaceful. And as soon as that control is threatened, I will feel anguish and I will need to do whatever I can to get back in control. Yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. I, I mean, of course, we don't all have 
those that extreme personality disorder. I guess I just always look for how can I relate to someone no matter where they are, no matter how distorted their perception of reality is. Can I find something in myself that says, oh, yeah, I remember that one time when I was selfish in a relationship. Like I, if someone can't see that about themselves, then they maybe sell themselves a bill of goods, right? Yes, um, but this is very important because this is what yeah. I try. This is this is what my conditioning had me doing. Yeah. You know, I, there's a concept which is so helpful. It, it's, it says uh, you're over-functioning. You're over over-functioning. Over yeah. You're over-accepting. You're accepting things that you shouldn't accept instead you should just say well okay this is this is where this is the song on love this is where i draw the line yes you know? well, okay I, I get what you're saying totally so i will make that distinction as well when i'm when i say this i mean i mean um when i'm say i'm working with somebody who's waking up or when i'm interacting with somebody in a situation where i don't really have a choice to interact with them say i work with them or something is a very different thing than personal boundaries Personal yes. boundaries are critical and yes. sensitive people, open people, people who are prone to waking up. It's very easy for us to um, let that boundary be pushed towards us too much. And it's really critical. There's a difference between recognizing and understanding and even accepting the fact that that person has narcissistic traits and, and not understanding that that doesn't mean I have to let them perpetuate those toward me or on me and so forth. So I don't know if that's the distinction you're making, but that is really important. Absolutely. That you, that's you know, exactly the actual boundaries. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what I meant. And that's where I feel that many sensitive people are struggling to make that, to draw that line and say, but yeah. this is not okay. It's right. Sort of, totally. 100%. It's, like, it's self abuse if I keep entertaining this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Don't justify bad behavior being perpetuated onto you ever. There's no reason to do it. There's just no reason. And I understand like, you know, pe some people really have, and especially because they grew up in families that are very close and connected and very healthy emotionally. Um, it makes so much sense to say, but that's your family, you know, but to yeah. me, family, family is largely like how, how do people actually treat you, you know, and, and, and in, in relationship, however that relationship started, is it a, you know, is it a, um, equanimous relationship? Is it, is it, um, is there give and take? Is, is there mutual trust? All that stuff. And to me, that's what defines a relationship rather than blood or rather than circumstance in my, in my experience. So I'm totally with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. See, I love talking about this stuff because we just always come up with these like great distinctions and important points. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so let's talk about music. Um, do, well, when, when we talked about doing this this interview, um, I, we, I suggested that I would like to uh, put in or edit in some of your work or your music or your songs. Um, did you did you do you have something I can use for that, or do you want do you want to how do you want to do that? I actually recorded something today, uh, which is. It's a, it's more like music video, you know, in the border, border between live footage used as a music video. So okay. that would be cool. recorded music that you find on Spotify. There's only one song. Okay. Um, and I don't know what you prefer. If you prefer, like, have me playing live. Um, or up you, to you. It's. I mean, it's really up to you. But I can. I, if you've already recorded that and you're okay with it, I can. I can just edit that right into this video, into our conversation somewhere. Maybe when you talked about going through that awakening and, and then yeah, having. Yeah, I think the, the 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 song that we recorded today is more related to this scene through uh, the narcissist. Okay. My father. That's cool. the, the song. Yeah. Because when I when I saw this that my father's narcissist, I had a period of four weeks where I cried almost full time. Wow! And that it just it just wouldn't stop. Mm. And that was when I started to write the song "Only Love." Oh, okay. And so that was a very very powerful uh, experience. And then after four weeks, it was just gone. Wow. It was like a rain cloud that I passed through. Yeah. And, yeah. and it was it was a delicate experience. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I was sad, but it was just sadness moving through me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, what I'll do then I'll edit the song into that that part, right? Yeah. 
as we're discussing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. Right on. And you can play live if you want to. It's totally up to you. You don't, don't have no pressure at all. But if that's feel like something you want to do. Yeah, but I think that it would be better if I do that, not in this session, but sure. I, I put record it into my my computer and, and edit it. And Perfect. Sound record, and then I could. Uh, Let's do it. Is it would this be good with this background? Totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Very cool. So, so what would you say to someone who is, you know, watching this video, watching and watches my, my channel, and these videos, who's interested in awakening or waking up um, and starting out and they're like, I don't really know what this whole thing is about, this awakening business, but I, something about it really resonates. It, sometimes it confuses me hearing this talk, but something in me knows that's where I want to go. What advice would you give them? Oh, that's a tough one. I think that if, if, if we're going to be, keep it so generalized mm -hmm. that I know so little, I would just emphasize to, to really connect with, with the heart presence and, and really make that the guiding principle rather than, than what, what the teachers say or, or mm -hmm. because it, yeah, it's, yeah, that, that's the most general rule or, or mm -hmm. people advice that I think I could give like I can see that it's so easy to, to follow what what seems to be the perfect way mm -hmm. from, from the mind so to speak and this feels more daring because it's not so smart or clever mm. intuitive Dar daring you said daring yeah daring yeah. also yeah I love that. That's a great answer. It's a great yeah. answer. Okay. What advice would you give someone who's starting out as a singer songwriter um, and working to find their voice, working to find their, their niche or working to find that deep authenticity and in, in, in to be able to relate to the audience? I would say I would want to split up in two, have the singer part and then the songwriter part. Uh, the singer, the, the voice is, has been absolutely critical to me to, instead of listening to my voice, I start to feel my voice. Mm. Because when you're present with the vibration of how it feels, you're actually present 100% where the sound is created. Mm. And if, if you sing a tone that is off or perfect pitch, mm. it pretty much feels the same, but what if you start to sing in a way that it feels good, mm -hmm. there's as little strain as possible, it becomes so, your voice becomes so inviting, mm. because it's like, when you, when you start to feel your voice, there's nothing to go like, oh my god, it shouldn't feel like that. Mm. I'd like, oh, that didn't feel comfortable, hmm, let me see how I can do it as it so it feels more comfortable and that it's a very kind and loving approach to your voice mm. we hear the voice we have so many ideas of how it should sound how it should not sound and it's so easy to become critical mm -hmm. and that's a great way to step out of that criticism and start to feel your voice it becomes a yeah like a relationship like yeah. a love relationship that is based on feeling like how Different sounds like mm, ah, how, mm. how does it feel? How can how can you feel it in the fingertips? How can you feel it in the toes? And it's like when you really become more and more accustomed to that, it's 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 such a wonderful way to sing to, to approach your voice. That so is that would be, awesome yeah. advice. I love it. Yeah, I'm glad I asked. It took me oh boy, it took me almost 50 years to to, to get that. Mm -hmm. And I had heard it before, but it wasn't until I really recognized how incredibly that this is the most important aspect. Mm -hmm. Because if we are listening to that voice, we have so many conditions of, is it good enough? Is it blah, 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 blah. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a way to quiet that condition. Nice. Get into a very new, more intimate conditioning. Mm -hmm. So that would be for the songer, or for the singer. And for the songwriter, I would start with what my favorite exercise, which 
is called sense-bound imagery uh, writing or sense-bound object writing. And this is like, for instance, you pick an object, a glass, and then you're going to use this object as a diving board. And you're just going to start with some kind of sense-bound perception. There's nothing about stories. It's nothing mm. about rhymes. It's nothing about poetry. It's just about, again, conditioning your writing to be sense-bound. So maybe I have this, start off writing about this sound. And through that sound, maybe there's a spoon, tinky, 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 tink. Mm. And that, that takes me, I'm associating freely, it takes me into the harbor where mm. the sailing boat is rocking and there's a sound when the lion is hitting the mast. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, yep. and that takes me out into the sea and it's, I start to feel this sucking feeling in my stomach and that takes me to the amusement park and I, I'm on this roller coaster ride and that takes me later to the popcorn stand and you just go on and on and, and, and put words on those experiences as they are felt mm. and that is what, what will open up your lyric writing to become very unique because nice. this is your experiences. This is you, you're not imagining. You go into your own experiences, and it just so happens that that unique writing will be so relatable mm. because it's it's you know the human experience. <laughs> That's beautiful. Oh, yeah. I, love it. Oh, and that, I, I would really recommend Pat Patterson writing better lyrics. Okay. It's it's a absolute his work is incredible pat patterson pat writing. patterson yeah cool yeah. all right and my last question some because we talked about narcissism and or you know family members or someone you're close to if somebody's in a relationship with with a narcissist or they're in a lot of contact with someone that they feel like relates in that way you're talking about like or they can relate to what you described as a narcissist what advice would you give them I think it's so hard to give give uh, general advice because it so much depends on, on you know, the intensity mm -hmm. and what, what yeah. kind of relationship it is. Is, is it, is it a, a mother who has a narcissistic husband and they have a child together? It's going to be very different. That's true. Yeah. It's like in my case, I have, I'm a grown up man and my father, we haven't had a lot of contact because my energy had just pulled away from him without yeah. knowing why really. So it, I think it's a really tough one to, to answer generally of what it, well, I guess the general answer would be seek out some kind of resource mm -hmm. that, that deals with this, some kind of uh, really trustworthy facilitator or a, a group or some kind of support system. Yeah. Because you need to be con conditioned out of the conditioning that says there's something wrong with you that you completely always distrust yourself yeah. that that you're going to need some some kind of support i think that's really good advice to have a an objective third party because you're so ingrained in the relationship it's hard to know am i overreacting am i underreacting but yeah. a facilitator someone who knows this process yeah. uh and you trust i think would yeah that's that's really good advice yeah, and they really have to know what this is so you don't yeah. end up end up with someone who's like well have you tried this yeah you know? yeah yeah for sure. Okay, I think that's good advice. Well, I do appreciate your time. Um, this was a really good conversation. We went to all kinds of interesting places, and um, I already know my my viewers are going to get a lot out of this for sure. Uh, and I look forward to seeing the music and getting it edited in. So, so this will be just that much more fun when it when I'm able to release it. Yes, I'm really. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Oh. Make sure that um, you let anyone know where they can find your music or any of your resources, and I will put all those links right under the video as well. Okay, great. Yeah. So, do you want to say any particular yeah. like platform? I'm uh, on my on my homepage, carljonas.com. Uh, I have this kind of five songs, five stories, so where people can go and, and receive five songs and, and five stories behind the songs. Great. Uh, just sign up for that. Very good. 
Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, yeah. Thanks so much.